Welcome to Muslim Apologetics Australia. I hope you're doing well. Please subscribe if you haven't, share the video, give a thumbs up. And, you know, if you have any input you'd like to suggest for my next video, put a comment below. If you want me to discuss other certain issues, put, put that forward. I'd like to hear your thoughts in the comments. If there is some things that you want to suggest, please put them in the comments. Nevertheless, let's now discuss this issue. It's the current issue that the Muslims are facing. It makes me sad. It worries me. Um, it, at, at the same time, it, it sort of encourages me to continue, to continue to fight the good fight. Um, so the current climate, the current crisis, there are certain brothers who are doing fantastic work in this field, dedicating their lives, trying to hold on to the traditional Islamic values, which is now being hindered, which is trying to be reformed by the reformists, the so-called Muslims, the ones who claim that they are apparently on the sunnah. And uh, one of the reasons why I'm motivated to make this video is because I met a relative recently, uh, someone that I really love and cherish. And even though I'm disappointed, I still love him to death. And I hope Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens his heart and brings him back to guidance. I believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who guides. And if he guides, then none can misguide. And whoever he misguides, none can guide. So in that aspect, we need to understand that a natural phenomenon is taking place. That is that a time will come where misguidance will be prevalent. It will be expanded. Uh, and these are the signs of the last days, the times where the Dajjal will appear, many Muslims will be misguided, ignorance will be widespread. And this isn't just about the Kuffar, this is about Muslims. And so there are certain individuals who are trying to reform Islam, trying to misinterpret Islam, and it, it's not something new. Uh, there are people who are getting influenced by these people, and they're getting fooled by these individuals. And it's not new. I mean, people like Mufta, Mufti Abu Leif, uh, you know, speakers like this, Yasir Ghadir, for example. Um, and there are others, Amir Suleiman. I mean, there are, there are many others, okay. But this isn't something new. The, the same group of people who are influenced by these people, these modern scholars, apparently, they're also the same ones who have always been prejudiced against classical Islamic thought, against traditional Islamic thought. They're the same ones that constantly criticize Wahhabi scholars and Saudi scholars, you know, saying, oh, they don't know Islam. Their interpretation of Islam is too harsh. The interpretation is not in line with the Quran or the Sunnah. And it's, you know, it's it's. It's men driving this uh, masculine ideology of sexism in their interpretation. It's too harsh, whatever. Right, you get the point. So these type of Muslims will leave those traditional scholars, those classical scholars or even historical scholars, and they would appeal to the more self-proclaimed, some of them are self-proclaimed, not all, uh, modern scholars. Uh, and this is a justification for them to do what they always wanted to do. So just an example, um, a good relative of mine, like I said, I love him to death. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless his soul and, and hopefully bring him back to guidance. He basically was on the Salafi manhaj, the Ahlu Sunnah Manhaj. Um, and we've seen over the years how, for example, um, there, there were signs, you could see signs of 
misguidance. Um, you know, for example, through his wife, the wife would be dressing inappropriately, even though she's covered. Um, and, you know, for the makeup and the TikTok tutorials or the, you know, Instagram or whatever it is, you know, uh, face, face painted like a cake and trying to act like Kim Kardashian in the hijabi version of Kim Kardashian. Um, and, and you see that the brother was struggling with this. Um, it was like they were fighting, you know, to stay on Islam and trying to counter Islam with modernity. Um, and then you see that over time, the brother actually starts deviating as well. Um, and so that's why I'm making this video. So it's more of an education purpose, an advice purpose. It's a purpose to tell you about the warning signs. It's about to remind myself and you know, this I'm not doing this video, you know, for showing off purposes or to say that I'm better than him or her or, you know, I'm no, I'm, that is not my purpose. I'm not trying to get bigger ratings. I'm not trying to get paid by YouTube and trying to become, you know, a celebrity status. No, I'm just an average Muslim and I'm here. If I see something wrong, I'm going to try and advise. Um, and that is my objective. Um, so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make my, make my advice sincere for him. My dawah is only sincere for Allah. May Allah protect me from any type of riyah or minor shirk. It is purely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is, um, I mean, I don't even claim I'm a scholar. I don't, I'm just a student of knowledge. Um, you know, but, you know, I live in a liberal secular country. I hope to God, I hope to God I can get myself financially ready where I can depart and leave this country because it's at war with Islam, with its ideology. And I'm seeing Muslims losing their religion. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said that a person will go to bed at night as a believer and he will wake up as a disbeliever think about that he will go to bed as a believer and wake up as a disbeliever some theologians and some muslim scholars or you know they thought that this could be you know a person believes in allah and in the morning he suddenly just doubts Allah and he becomes a disbeliever. But that's not necessarily what that actually means. Because you could have doubts, you could believe in Allah, you could say things that are displeasing, you could turn something haram into halal and accept that, and you can still wake up in the morning as a Muslim, claiming you're a Muslim, claiming you're still in the fold of Islam. But perhaps you woke up and you changed your mind and you thought you're now going to believe that thing that was haram is now halal. And you've now classified that. And now you're promoting that openly. That can take you outside the fold of Islam. Of course, the liberal secular mindset or the liberal Muslims, the modernist Muslims say, oh, no, 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 as long as he he's, you know, makes the shahada, he's a Muslim. Really? So I'm guessing that those same folks believe that ISIS is also Muslim because they also classify the shahada. I mean, do they really believe that? Or they, do they believe that ISIS have, have left the fold of Islam with their khawarij mentality where they believe that every kuffar, their blood is now halal for them? Of course, a liberal secularist or the modernist Muslim would say, oh, no, no, they're not real Muslims. You know, they're just, uh, you know, agents, agents of the West. You know, it doesn't matter where they declare shahada. They're not really believers, right? So why then 
a double standard? Why don't we apply that same logic to those who have a different view on Islam? Of course, not every view takes you into apostasy. Um, you know, you could have, I mean, scholars have got difference of opinion on certain issues, but there are some issues that are like day and night, where the hudud, for example, it is prescribed in Islam, certain legal things in Sharia, and people openly deny it, saying it's not part of Islam, it's not even in the hadith. And if it is in the hadith and it's authentic, then it's actually false. It's a false hadith. It's, I mean, that could take you into disbelief because if the hadith is sahih and it's what the Prophet said, rejecting the hadith is as if you were rejecting the Prophet ﷺ. So that could constitute disbelief. So that said, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I'm saying this, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala curse, curse people like Mufti Abu Layf. This man is one of the reasons, one of the reasons why these Muslims are getting misguided. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cut his tongue out of his mouth for the lies he invents against Islam. People like him are, in my view, they're considered apostates, monafics, hypocrites, who are trying to destroy Islam from within. The relative that I mentioned, he was, mashallah, on the proper manhaj, on Salaf al Saleh, he deviated because of listening to individuals like this. Right? So, seeing those subtle changes in him made me wonder. And I questioned. And he told me he listens to people like this. And you know what his justification was? He said, I already believed in the things that. Abu, uh, Mufti Abu Leif believes in, but Mufti Abu Leif just explained it and made, clarified it in more detail for me and reaffirmed the position I already had in my heart. So as a Salafi, he was always in this presumption that he had these doubts about certain hadiths or certain uh, views on Islam, but people like Mufti Abu Leif just encouraged him to divert. So, for example, he will claim things like there are certain narrations in Sahih Bukhari that are fabricated. So, it's not even Sahih anymore. Right? Um, for example, the way his wife behaves. Um, and so that made me question you know, what's going on? What's going on in his head? And Lord and behold, um, I found out recently that he started actually listening to Imran Hussein. That uh, well, he's not a Sufi. I'm not. I, I don't think he's a Sufi. Maybe he does have a few Sufi beliefs. Um, but yeah, Imran Hussein. I thought, okay, Imran Hussein's yeah deviant. We already know that's established. He's got deviant views. But when he told me he now listens to Mufti Abu Layth, that just drawed the line for me and I thought, oh my God, like this is this is just insanity now. I mean everyone knows, well most of the conservative Muslims know the religion of Mufti Abu Layth. So if you want to see how Mufti Abu Layth misinterprets Islam, I've actually put a few articles um, on my blog. I'll put a hyperlink below this here and you can see. So basically their aim is to um, misinterpret, for example, Sahih Bukhari uh, to, I mean, because they could, they could try and manipulate the Quran. They could try and misinterpret the Quran, right? But see, what stops in their way is the Hadith. 
The hadith sometimes becomes a lot more explicit. It goes into more detail um, than the Quran. Uh, further detail. That's what I'm talking about. It expands on it. Just as you might have commentary on the Quran. And so because of this, because of this barrier, that this, this wall in front of them, their aim is now to chop down the hadith um, to claim that you know it's unauthentic, it's more man-made, um, and therefore it's more prone to error. Um, and you know so they try and devalue the hadith in order to dismiss it at any God-giving will as so long as it can approve their modernity, their way of life, right? Their comfort zone, right? So, for example, if you love dogs and you, you know, you want to have a dog and you want to have it even in your home, then who do you go to? Do you go to a classical scholar? Do you go to a historical scholar? See what he said? Do you go to, uh, you know, Hadith? Or do you go to Mufti Abu Lais? Well, you go to Mufti Abu Lais. He will make it halal for you. He will find a way to either misinterpret, take certain Hadith out of context. And we know how they do these things. Let me just give you an example. Mufti Abu Leif published a video on gold. Uh, where the gold, where wearing wearing the gold is haram. Now I've published an article in response to this. I think I've done a video. I'm not sure if it's a video or an article, but anyway, I'll put the hyperlink below this video. You can go figure it out. Um, and so, so basically, this is how these innovators work, right? So they'll say, for example, yes, in Sahih Bukhari or Sahih Muslim or Ibn Majah or Abu Dawud, yes, there are hadiths that say the Prophet Sallallahu said that whoever wears gold um, or whoever wears um, yeah, these, these things, gold or silk, then... Um, you know he'll be among the fire, or you know he will um, he'll be branded with fire, with brass and metal on the day of judgment as a punishment and things like this, right? So then what they do is they say, okay, we will find an isolated hadith, or we will find another hadith that mentions certain Sahaba wearing gold. Therefore, there's now a contradiction. So what do we do? Now, the Quran doesn't say explicitly that gold wearing gold is forbidden. So if we're going to rely on the hadith, now the hadith, there's now contradictions between the hadith. So therefore, we're going to dismiss the hadith altogether because now there's a contradiction. It just proves that hadith isn't reliable. We're going to stick to the Quran and now we're going to legitimize you wearing gold and silk, whatever. So this is how they work. This is this is primarily primary how they operate. But of course, there's a counter rebuttal, and I've seen their arguments. Okay, this is how weak it is. Like let, just an example. So we've all got the clear hadiths from the Prophet saying wearing the gold is haram and forbidden, and the hadith goes into detail. Right? It's clear. There's no ambiguity. So they'll bring up a hadith, for example, a certain Sahaba was seen wearing gold. Uh, and But then when you look at the hadith, and it says that in his armor while he was going to battle, whatever, there was a bit of gold in his banner or whatever it was, okay? Uh, just on his head banner or whether it was on his buttons. Sorry, the buttons, not the head banner. I think it was the buttons, right? The buttons of his cloak, his clothes. And you think to yourself, that's not really an argument because the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, when he said don't wear gold, you look at the hadith and he spoke about the people of Jahiliyyah wearing gold and they wore it to show off. They wore it around their necks as chains, as rings, you know, to really present that to the audience. 
present that to the communities, present that to the people. It was the most apparent form to display your status, like how wealthy you are, things like this, right? Um, and this is what the Prophet ﷺ was against, this type of wearing, you know, where it's displayed in this way. Now, the Sahaba, for example, if he wore a cloak and it was part, there was a bit of gold part of his button, right? Is that displaying any sort of power or is that is that displaying any sort of superiority like he thinks he's better than someone else? How is that how is that comparable to someone wearing a gold chain, for example, or a gold ring or a you know a gold watch, right? There's no comparison because we know that when people wear a gold watch or a gold chain, they're trying to promote, oh, look, you know, I'm, look, look, this is my wealth. I can, I can, you know, and they, they, they promote it. They display it that way. And so now these Muslims have listened to this Mufti Abu Leif's interpretation and now they're wearing gold bracelets, they're wearing gold uh, watches, they're wearing gold chains, because apparently they can connect that to other Sahaba who had a bit of inscription of gold that was part of the bottom materials of their cloak. I mean, do you, do you see how ignorant and how foolish their comparison is? And here's another point. Nowhere in the hadith does it say that after the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu declared it was haram, then the Sahaba were continuously wearing it. It could be possible that they were wearing it, and then the command came to forbid it, right? So the hadith doesn't say this hadith happened before this hadith, right? But like I said, they will misinterpret anything to legitimize their own desires, worldly desires. That is to undermine the hadith in order to remove it as an authority to dictate your din. Like they come up with these incredible arguments, right? Like, for example, um, you know, the relative that I was mentioning. He says, for example, he doesn't believe that the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ married a nine-year-old. And I tried to explain to him to say, look, the hadith doesn't mean it's it's fabricated or not sahih. It's in Bukhari and, and so forth. And, and of course, you know, no one's saying that we should be marrying nine-year-old girls now because the hadith was, you know, showing marriages to a nine-year-old 1,400 years ago. And biology has obviously changed since then. Uh, human development has changed. Um, you know, women of today or girls of today aren't of girls 1,400 years ago. Just as life expectancy has changed over the biological years. I mean, people were procreating earlier because... People barely made it to their 30s or 40s because they'd die from disease or so forth. So procreation was necessary at that time. Um, uh, early procreation was necessary. Um, and so so basically, you know, human development could have been different. Women could have matured a lot earlier um, uh, back then based on the environmental factors. Uh, maybe... Today's 17 year old or 18 year old girl was like the nine year old girl 1400 years ago. It's possible, right? Um, but of course, they don't think that is, that is an, an acceptable argument, so they try and dismiss the hadith. And so they come up with all of these false narratives like here's here's one right listen to this one so basically they're saying um the one that narrated the hadith was the nephew of aisha radiolanho and they say that one of the reasons listen to this one of the reasons why hadith narrators 
or, or the, well, the nephew of Aisha Radiolan said that she was nine years old, tried to draw her age as low as possible, was because, listen to this argument, because you know how they made a slander about Aisha Radiolan, saying that um, she would... Uh, you know, she would cheat on the prophet or something, or she wasn't a virgin or something, or or she was already sleeping around with other men before the prophet um, and things like this. So these slanders and these accusations were circulating. And so the narrator, who was a nephew of Aisha Radiolan, said that uh, her auntie or whatever it was, uh, Aisha, she was... Um, uh, nine years old, drew the age lower in order to say, well, no, she couldn't have been cheating on the prophet or sleeping with all these other men even outside before she got married because when she got married, she was nine years old. So it wasn't like she was 17 years old or 18 years old going out, having fun with guys and then settling down with the prophet. No, she was. she actually got married really early. So, you know to dismiss the slanders against uh, Aisha. I mean, this, this argument is so fallacious. It is so ridiculous. Like, <laughs> I mean, if that was the case, the Prophet, I mean, the Quran itself clears Aisha's name. There's a verse revealed about Aisha in the Quran where Allah actually clears the slander. So why would a hadith narrator who is um, the nephew of Aisha Radiolan, why would he go and uh, make something like this up in order to clear her name when the Quran itself clears her name? And secondly, if people were accusing Aisha Radiolan of committing uh, adultery or if, they were, if she was fornicating uh, outside marriage or inside marriage or wherever it is, who says that she couldn't do it when she was 16 or 17? Right? Someone could say, well, at 16 or 17, behind the Prophet's back, she was sleeping around with other men. Elder Billah. Right? So, again, that, that doesn't make sense to draw her age to nine years old. Uh, the third point, and I find this the most bizarre, are these people saying that the nephew who is actually Sahaba of Aisha Radiallan, are they now suggesting, are they now suggesting that this Taibi'in, this Sahabi Taibi'in or Taibi'in, you know, the part of the early generation, the, the thir three generations, are they now saying that in order to protect Aisha's name, to draw it back to nine years old, right? This was done in order to protect Aisha's name. But isn't this insulting the Prophet's name? So it makes no sense where he's trying to protect Aisha's name, but at the same time insulting the Prophet's name by claiming he married a child. So this Sahaba was interested in protecting Aisha, this Tayyibin, but he wasn't interested in protecting the Prophet's name. I mean, do you see how bizarre that is? Now, moving forward, I mean, when it comes to adultery, punishing adulteresses, for example, stoning, the Prophet ﷺ stoned even a woman, according to the Hadith. I mean, these progressives, I mean, again, this is my relative who's saying this. Obviously, he's listening to Mufti Abu Leif. Because Mufti Abu Leif told him that, oh, you know, adultery, there's there's no stoning to death. This is bizarre. This is barbaric. And people like Yasir Qadi say this as well. I hold Yasir Qadi accountable on the Day of Judgment for changing the hudud, changing the din of Islam. You know, these people are promoting, no, we need to progress now. And they're using, you know, Scholars, for example, you know, some scholars are saying, oh, look, uh, they're saying um, back then, back 1400 odd years ago, yes, you know, people, people, um, people did things like this. But, you know, the hadith is false. The hadith, you know, true Islam, the Quran, you know, they say 
punishing adulteresses, that's not in the Quran. You know, stoning to death, that's not in the Quran. And so they claim that, you know, modern scholars are now interpreting, reinterpreting Islam, apparently. And so they say it's it's fabricated, even if it's in Sahih Bukhari. You know, why would the Prophet do that? So I asked this individual, I said, okay, fair enough, fair enough, okay. So you don't believe in the uh, punishing of the adulteresses, you know, the stoning. Okay, fine. Okay, so the Quran says to cut the hand of the thief. Okay, you reject the hadith. Okay, what about the Quran? So I was waiting for him to say, oh, you know, yeah, you know, I'm pretty sure Mufta Abu Leif has an interpretation. Oh, it's like tattooing the skin. It's not really cutting the skin and all this garbage, right? Anyway, so basically he said, Oh, you know, you know, and this argument always comes up. Um, it, pro, presume me from Mufti Abu Leif, without a doubt. You know, people back then were really barbaric, and, you know, those people were, um, you know, they needed tough laws. And that's why, you know, Islam came and, and the Hadith came and the Quran was there. And the Hadith, for example, you know, legislated to cut the hand off, and the Quran also legislated to cut the hand off because these people were barbaric, they're really rough people, and so you needed strong deterrence, strong punishments against these people. <laughs> but this argument can be clearly refuted so easily because even the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, if the daughter of the Prophet Fatima stole, took something, Without permission, stole, thieved, became a thief. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, I would be the first one to cut her hand off. So here is a question. Here's a question. Was Fatima Radiolanhu, was she also barbaric? Was she also a rough person? Was she also a barbarian that required a harsh penalty? So my relative, he's got a dog as well. We'll get to that now, right? So, you know, I've been listening to Abu Leif's videos about dogs and why he thinks it's now permissible, right? So I'm trying to educate myself to see, you know, how are we going to refute this? What What's he bringing up? Whatever. And I mean, his, the arguments are so lame. Let me give you another example, right? So he says, for example, oh, you know, the Prophet Muhammad commanded, you know, that you can use dogs for hunting purposes and animals and beasts, you know, if you want to hunt them. And he says, oh, if the um, if the, the saliva of the dog is impure, you know, why does that animal get unleashed to chase that prey and sink its fangs into that beast? into that prey um, and then you eat from it you know you know isn't that how is that now halal for you because you know that that meat has now got the saliva of the animal it's, it becomes impure now so how can the saliva of the dog be impure so he makes arguments like that to say oh look you know the hadith are fabricated it's not sahih it's it's uh, it's contradictory to other hadiths, and this is what they do, right? But again, these are clear misinterpretations, because anyone that uses some common sense, right, can understand that although the teeth of the dog may go into the prey, there are other hadith, for example. Um, so the hadith is in Abu Dawud 2858. It reads, If he shoots at the prey and the part of its body is severed from it, but the animal is still alive, it is haram to eat the severed part. There is no difference of opinion among the fuqaha concerning that because of the words of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. Whatever is cut from an animal when it is alive is maita, dead meat. All right, Dubai. So the same sort of logic applies there. So basically, if the animal, um, your dog, for example, your hunting dog puts a teeth into uh, the prey, you can basically cut that bit 
of the meat out and throw it away. You don't have to consume the whole meat. There are other things. You can skin it, um, and which will reduce most of the impurity, the saliva. You can also wash the meat seven times. You know, if a dog licks your hand, you wash your hand seven times. It then changes it from an impurity to a pure. Same as the meat. You can wash the meat seven times, which will make it pure again. So there are many examples you can give to purify the meat. Um, so, you know, like I said, their arguments are fallacious and there is no wisdom. It can be clearly counter -abutted. And again, refer to my article here, Refuting Mufti Abu Leif on his criticism on Sahih Bukhari. I've listed numerous articles, uh, sorry, responses to his claims, how he misinterprets and things like that. You know, Mufti Abu Leif is not in this by himself, you know. You can listen to this, for example. You can see a Yasir Qadi lecture that's just been uploaded one week ago, right? And I went through the lecture and it just amazed me. It amazed me, right, how they just misinterpret the din incredibly, like openly. And they claim, you know, they're, they're scholars, you know, he's, the guy's got scholarship, right? But he's a reformist, right? So even if you're a scholar, you can be a reformist. You can deviate from the huck. It can happen even to the best amongst us. And he's a primary example. And this is why it's so sad. Like I got to the 34th mark, right? There were so many objectionable things in the lecture, right? But listen to this particular point, because this is a new phenomenon that has, take, has been taken from the Christians. You know, don't judge or you will be judged. Don't, um, you know, the story of adulteresses, you know, in the Bible where uh, Jesus gets an adulterous woman brought to him. And Jesus says, those without sin cast the first stone. And Christians take this concept to say we shouldn't be judging. Um, you know, only God can judge me and things like this. So they're trying to take Islamic rulership, Islamic judges out of the question. I mean, do they really believe that? Do they really believe that we shouldn't have Sharia courts? We shouldn't judge people? Really? The same people who claim that, they get judged by Western courts, right? That's, that's the irony. Of this right so again this is their way of shutting down criticism don't judge me don't tell me that this is an innovation don't tell me that this is haram you are not the judge of me allah is the judge of me so they discredit what the prophet actually said in the hadith the prophet said if you see an evil then try and stop it these same people if you criticized if the white people, if the racist, if the white nationalists, if they said racial slurs against the black community, then Yasser Ghadi and all the modern Muslims, they're already judging the white race, those white individuals, saying, look at you, it's your colonial ancestry. You know, this is racism, this is nationalism. Judging them. Right? They're the first ones to judge them. But soon as you judge a sister for not wearing the hijab properly, oh, we are not the judges. We are witnesses. Listen to what Yasir Ghadi says. Our role is to not be selfish, to not be living in our self-imposed bubbles. Our role is to be shuhada'a linnas ala nas. People need to know what the truth is. And it's not our job to force anybody. We are witnesses, not judges. Allah is the judge. But we are witnesses. Which means if nobody else is speaking the truth, and if we are too shy to speak the truth, who else will be left to speak the truth? Then we have failed in our job for which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala... Notice we are witnesses. We are witnesses, we are not judges. Let's see what Umar ibn Khattab said. Umar ibn Khattab said, this is in Sahih Bukhari 
2498, Umar ibn Khattab said, We judge by what's apparent and we leave the inner secrets to Allah. Notice, he didn't say, We are witnesses by what's apparent and we leave the inner secrets to Allah. No, he said, We are judge. We judge by what's apparent and we leave the inner secret to Allah. But of course, Yasir Qadi is the same guy that said if Umar ibn Khattab took a Aqidah test, he would fail. <laughs> right? <laughs> he would fail. The giant of Islam would fail in an Aqidah test. Not only are they trying to diminish the Hadith, not only are they trying to belittle and discredit the Hadith, they are even trying to discredit the knowledge, the knowledge of the greatest Sahaba. Not just any Sahabas, one of the greatest of the greatest Sahabas who became a Khilaf for Islam. But apparently he would fail in an Aqidah test. The man that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said he was shown Jannah and he was shown a palace and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wanted to visit that palace and one of the angels I believe according to the hadith said this is this belongs to Umar Umar ibn Khattab so this is a man who was being given glad tidings of Jannah a man who was being given glad tidings of Jannah would fail an Aqidah test apparently where many narrations actually glorify the knowledge, not just as a statesman, but the knowledge of Umar ibn Khattab. You know, it's really interesting. If you actually listen to the whole lecture, uh, Yasir Qadir, you notice he says, oh, we're only witnesses, we're not judges. In that lecture, he actually says that if a Shia, if a Shia was invited to his he would not invite a shia to his mosque to give a lecture right um and he, here is a question is he not judging that shia that he does not allow that shia to come to his masjid to give you a lecture so is that witnessing or is that judging so subhanallah it's like they say one thing and then do another thing Alda billah this is, of course, a very small example. There are lists of examples of the deviance of these people. And I want to end it by this, right? What is so upsetting is that the condition of Muslims are changing so much that sisters and brothers are coming off Islam. They're practicing it half-heartedly. Um, you know, they're wearing, you know, makeup, tight clothing and a hijab on. You know, not even understanding what hijab actually means anymore. You know, you know, it doesn't mean about covering up your beauty anymore. No, it's about showing how thin you are, how great your legs still look in that hijab, and your body figure still looks, how good your lips look. You know, it's it's not really a hijab anymore. It's you know they want to attract. You know, the hijab is supposed to be to disattract the opposite agenda and they're trying to wear the hijab and then they put all this makeup on trying to attract everyone to look at them <laughs> it's like the opposite and then you have brothers coming off the din you know cutting off their beards not following the sunnah anymore properly discrediting the, the hadith and you see people like Umar Suleiman Yasir Qadi people like even Mufti Menk um, you don't see them talking about these crises you don't see them warning Muslims about, about this. You don't see them warning sisters not to do this. Why is that? Now, I mean openly, come out, Umar Suleiman, Yasir Qadir, Mufti Abu Laith. <laughs> come out, say that this is wrong. Don't do this. Right? And they, they don't. They're not coming out and facing the crises because you know why people like Yasir Qadir have said we don't want to be identified as a hate preacher hate preacher right 
if they come out and say those things, they want they they're going to be now be classified as Wahhabi scholars, hate preachers. Imagine, is that what the instruction was when the Prophet ﷺ said? He said, if you see evil, if you see a sin, then try and change it. He said that. And what these guys are saying is, I don't want to be a hate preacher. The Prophet's saying, it doesn't matter if they classify you as a hate preacher, speak against it, because this is haq. This is, this is what you need to do to remind people, advise people. Because they look up to you at the end of the day. You claim that you are now the modern scholars. So why aren't you talking about these common issues, these common crises, right? Why? But guess what they're doing? Instead, Yasir Qadi, I'm talking to you, they're now listening to Mufti Abu Alayf, who's continuously, continuously misguiding them. But you're keeping your mouth shut. Of course he'll keep his mouth shut. Because he's the one who actually condones this behavior. He said it. A brother asked him, what is considered a beard in Islam? A beard. And you know what he said? He said, if you think it's a beard, then it's a beard. <laughs> right? So what happened to the minimum fist length? What happened to this? So if anyone considers something a beard, then a hairline could be a beard. Just a, it's a line. Right? That could be classified a bit. So according to him, one centimetre is a bit. Two centimetres is a bit. Three mil is a bit. One mil is a bit. Right? It's according to you, apparently. It's, it's what you feel at the end of the day. You know, back to that notion, our feelings. You know, he's trying to f fulfill that modern progression ideology. It's just how you feel. You want to question your sexuality? Just just how you feel. You think you're a man, and you, but you're a woman trapped in a man's body, or a woman trapped, or a man trapped in a woman's body. It's how you feel. It's how you feel is halal. Yeah. So same scenario. What you think, what you feel is the beard, is the beard. Subhanallah. What you feel, what you think is the hijab, is the hijab. Then. You know. Let's not do the prayer rituals, sujud, rukud. Let's do what you feel, what you think is the prayer. Just pray however you want then. It's how you feel at the end of the day, what you think the prayer should be. Just if you want to meditate and imagine that's your five daily prayer, then just do that then. Where does the buck stop with these people? And incredible, in the lecture he says, we should not deviate we should hold on to the rope of Allah. We should come together. Right? He says that. But do they come together on the Quran and Sunnah? No. They've got their own version of the Quran and Sunnah. And then they ex expect people to unite on what? On their version of the Quran and Sunnah. Which is, in essence, a deviation. Abadan. We do not unite. On misguidance. So this is Abu Leif. He's now promoting to take mushrooms. Magic mushrooms are now halal. You can now take magic mushrooms. Because, you know, the LSD found in magic mushrooms is not like the LSD or the, the chemicals found in alcohol. Right? Although, they cause hallucination. They cause your brain to malfunction. But it's all halal, apparently, because it can make you hallucinate about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and draw you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. SubhanAllah. Like I'm thinking to myself, this is this is the words of my relative, right? He listens to Abu Leif. He's saying that he's now going to take magic mushrooms. He's been taking magic mushrooms. He describes it as like flying to the moon and back. SubhanAllah. And I asked him, why? Why do you need to do this? He says, oh, it's not really haram. And Abu Leif said it's not haram. And, you know, it's, uh, it, it draws me closer to, you know, it gives me the third eye. It draws me closer to Allah because, you know, I can actually experience Allah and I can experience and see things, you know, of Jannah and these beautiful places. And it helps my iman. And I'm thinking, really, Aki? Really? Is that really an argument? What is the matter 
haven't you been convinced? Do you really need to take a magic trip to be convinced of Islam? What more conviction do you want? Hasn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala given you enough signs in the Qur'an, in the linguistic miracle of the Qur'an? Hasn't he given you enough signs? Don't you look at science and you look at the cell, the way it functions and the miracle in the design in the cell. What more do you want? Do you want to say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? you want to have a trip and say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What more do you want to be convinced with? This is another excuse to enhance your body, to feel desires and maximum pleasure, you know, the atheist concept. Feel maximum pleasure, you know, it's like a calm down drug. This is going to lead to all other evils. Anxiety can put you in coma, um, you know, and cause depression when you're coming down from these drugs. It's all, it's published. Anxiety and depression. So what we had is we had a brother who's, mashallah, Salafi, the beard, this, that, you know, um, you know on the hark. And he's now gone to having a dog, wife dressing the way she wants to dress. He's gone to smoking now magic mushrooms. And then these people say, oh, no, you know, we're on the huck. You know, you Wahhabi Salafis are extreme now. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. The hadith are weak. Sahih, the sahih, sahih hadith are made up. Subhanallah. You know, put away, you know, having dogs and having this or having that. These people are going now into forms of apostasy, outright rejection of conservative Islam. This could be leading to coming outside of the fold of Islam. That is the dangers here. So may Allah ruin Mufti Abu Layth as he's trying to ruin Many Muslim homes and many Muslim families are being ruined by this guy. May Allah's nalet, naletullah, nalet be upon this person. Assalamu alaikum brothers. Thank you for listening in and um, uh, may Allah keep you guys guided. Let this be a warning um, and uh, stick to the haq brothers. Stick to the haq. Hold on. Hold on, these are the times of Dajjal. These are the times of Fitna. These are the times of the Antichrist. These are the times, brothers.